ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله we begin of course by praising Allah we praise him we seek his help we ask for his forgiveness and we take refuge with Allah from the evil of ourselves and from the evil consequence of our evil actions whomsoever Allah guides no one can misguide and whomsoever Allah leaves to go astray no one can guide and i testify that Allah alone is worthy of worship and that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is indeed the servant of Allah and his final messenger my dear brothers and sisters in islam may Allah have mercy upon you in our last discussion we were talking about shirk and i mentioned of course amongst the group of people are the christians and indeed allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and i'm going to read the translation here of the quran and allah talks so beautifully such beautiful words in such amazing simple yet profound language allah talks about the shirk those people those christians who have confused their belief and have associated jesus the son of mary as being equal with god so allah says in surah al-maida which is the fifth surah of the quran in the 72nd ayah so let's read what it says and if you've got your qurans with you maybe you can open them and read them as well inshallah so let's see what allah says it says surely they have disbelieved who say allah is the messiah surely they have disbelieved who say allah is the messiah son of mary but the messiah said he himself said jesus said o children of israel worship allah my lord and your lord verily whoever sets up partners in worship with allah then allah has forbidden paradise to him and the fire will be his abode and for the wrong doers there are no helpers surely disbelievers are those who say allah is the third of the three allah is one of three but there is no god that has the right to be worshiped except the one god allah and if they do not stop from what they say then certainly a painful punishment will befall the disbelievers among them will they not turn in repentance look at this my brothers and sisters in spite of all this this injustice this wrong doing this saying something so terrible to claim that allah is a human being to claim that a human being who eats who breathes who walks who is born who dies a human being that depends every moment for his existence upon allah is equal with god with allah yet still allah says will they not turn in repentance will they not give this up will they not seek forgiveness allah is inviting them won't they turn to allah and seek his forgiveness for allah is oft forgiving oft forgiving he forgives again and again and again and the most merciful and then allah explains the messiah isa jesus the son of mary was no more than a messenger many were the messengers that passed away before him his mother was a pious woman they both used to eat food look how we make the signs clear for them yet look how they are deluded away from the truth say o muhammad how do you worship besides allah something which has no power either to harm or benefit you but allah is he who is the all hearer the all knower so it's very beautiful how allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pointing out a simple fact don't you see that jesus and mary they ate food does god eat food does allah the creator god eat can you give birth to god does god die no god allah does not eat he does not drink he is not born he does not die because he is the ever living who never dies he is the eternal 
He is one and alone without partners, without rivals. How did it happen that this religion of Christianity moved from the teaching of Jesus, which clearly as we read, Jesus believed that Allah was one. Jesus himself worshipped Allah. So how is it that this religion moved from being the religion that taught people to worship Allah to worshipping Jesus himself as Allah? You couldn't get something further away from that. How did it happen? It's very important for us to understand because this also makes us understand how shaitan, how the devil, how we, the human beings, have the potential to slip slowly, step by step, into something like shirk. And this is, of course, what happens. It doesn't happen all in once, in an instant, from one day this to the next day to that. No. It's happened slowly, it happens gradually, step by step, bit by bit, we get led astray. So in this regard, the Christians, the Prophet wasallam, he warned the Muslims, do not exaggerate in praising me in the same way that the Christians exaggerated in praising Jesus. I am the slave of Allah, Abdullah, and I am Rasulullah, and the slave of Allah and his messenger. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he is warning us, he's making it clear, he's warning us, don't do with me what the Christians did with Jesus. And how did they go astray? They exaggerated in praising. They went over the limits. They went too far. They transgressed the limits of religion. And so how did this start? Well, in the beginning, they began to call him the son of Allah. This is not a title that Jesus used about himself. He called himself the son of man, according to what even the evidence we have with us. Jesus, alayhi salam, used to refer to himself as the son of man. And Messiah means anointed one. So how did this title, son of God, start? Well, that's because... Paganism was something that was dominant in the world at the time of Jesus. And many people used to claim that they were the sons of gods. So you find, for example, Pharaoh, Alexander the Great, the Roman emperors. They often used to refer to themselves as being the sons of gods. And they used to claim that, in fact, they were gods. And so this is what you find. You find, for example, Alexander called himself the begotten son of Zeus. So then you find the Christians, they exaggerated in praising Jesus. They, instead of him being the messenger of God, they started to use this title to exaggerate, to say, well, he's like the son of God. And then from this imitating the pagans and from this imitating the saying of these people who had already confused their belief about God, then they began to also imagine that Jesus السلام, was a God. He was a God along with God. And then they began to pray to him and they began to imagine that he was equal with God and that he was eternal with God and so on and so forth. Step by step, stage by stage, they moved to this position. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam warned us about this. So my brothers and sisters, you see, I said that I will not be only explaining to you about this in and showing you proofs and evidences from the Quran and from the Sunnah, but also explaining to you the logic, the reason behind it. So let us look at this from a logical angle. This claim that, first of all, that someone Jesus or anybody could be the son of Allah. Well, what does this mean, son of Allah? You know, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said that Allah said, it's a hadith Qudsi, that verily or certainly, the son of Adam has insulted me and he had no right to do so. And the son of Adam has denied me and he had no right to do so. As for his insulting me, that is his saying that I have a son. And as for his denying me, that is his saying that once I am dust and bones, I will not be resurrected. 
So the last one is denying the power of Allah. It is easy for Allah to recreate us. Once we are dust and bones or even less than that, it is easy for Allah to create. He only needs to say be and it is. This is easy for Allah. To deny this is to deny Allah's power. And that is to deny Allah. And to claim that Allah has a son is to insult Allah. Because it is ascribing to Allah, the creator, the attributes, the limitations, the deficiencies of the creation. It is clear in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, Qul huwa Allahu ahad, Allahu samad, lam yalid wa lam yulad wa lam yakullahu kufwan ahad. Say he is Allah the one. Allah a samad, which means the one. Everything needs God and God doesn't need anything. Lam yalid. He is not born. So no one gave birth to God. He was not born. He is eternal, ever living. Walam yulad. And he doesn't give birth. He's not the father or the begetter of anyone. Because what does that mean? Begetting. That is the intimate act that takes place between a man and a woman. What do you mean to say Allah had a son, God had a son? What does this mean? Did God have a wife? Does God have a wife through which he has a son? Because that's what a son means. Your son, my son, is what is the product of an act that took place between us and our wife or us and our husband. That's the son. Does God commit that act? Well, even the Christian will say, no, of course not. So then what do you mean, son? Did God adopt Jesus as his son? But again, that doesn't make any sense. Because you can only take something as your son which is like you. That's all you can do. You know, if I had with me, for example, a little pet rabbit, and I said, this is Smokey, my son, you would say, but it's a rabbit. You can't. You know, I said, no, he, you know, I love him like a son. They, he eats with me at the table. The adoption papers are coming through next week, you know. But that's a rabbit. You're a human, that's a rabbit. You can't take something as your son that is not like you. And nothing is like God. There is nothing like God. There's nothing like Allah. What does it mean that Allah took a human being, a speck on the earth, which is a speck, in the galaxy, which is a speck, in a universe, which is a speck, in the desert, before the kursi, the, the chair, the, the footstool of Allah. It's insulting Allah to say that Allah took as a son something like a human being. He is far removed from that. He is glorious above that. So we have to be careful. We only say the truth. We only speak the truth. We say about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the pious people no more than the truth and don't exaggerate. This is a tendency that the human beings have and it's a tendency that shaitan encourages. Exaggerate in praising the human being. Exaggerate in loving the human being. But unfortunately, many Muslims have fallen into this. And this is a grave mistake. Literally, a grave mistake. So this is something what we should be very, very careful of. And this is a type of shirk that the Muslims have fallen into. Now, another one of the major sins, and this is actually the third major sin that uh, al Dhahabi mentioned in his book. And he mentions this after murder. And he mentions this as practicing magic. But in fact, I believe it should go before that. Why? Because practicing magic itself is actually a form of shirk. If you understand and you study this phenomena of magic and what does the magician believe and what is the magician trying to achieve, you will understand very clearly that practicing magic and believing in magic is impossible without making shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because actually what the magician tries to do is to pretend that he or she has the power that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has. And this is the illusion that the magician tries to create. And this is nothing, of course, except shirk. If you believe that a human being 
has the knowledge or the power or the ability that only belongs to Allah, then of course, my dear brothers and sisters, that is shirk. And this is exactly what the magician tries to do. But the magician does this through the means of deception. The magician doesn't really have that power. So for example, the magician will pretend to have the power to cause someone, this person to love that person, or this person to do that, or they will make something appear from nothing, or they will do many amazing type of things, or they will tell you something that is knowledge of the unseen. And this is also linked to fortune telling and astrology, which are also major sins that we will talk about next. So they are all connected with this topic of practicing magic. But the point being here is that the magician is trying to pretend that they have some of the power or some of the knowledge or some of the ability that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has. So it is very clear from the Quran and from Surah Al-Baqarah that the people who practice magic, they are disbelievers. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Baqarah, which is the second surah in the 102nd ayah. But the evil ones, the shayateen, disbelieved teaching people magic. So the devils disbelieved. And why did they disbelieve? And what is the cause of their disbelief? Is because they taught people magic. And what is the purpose of that? Of course, the devils, they taught magic because magic is something that leads people into shirk. It leads people into making partners with Allah. It leads people into thinking that the creation has the power that only belongs to Allah. This, my brothers and sisters, is all part of the test. This is all part of the fitna, the trials, the tests, the tribulations that we have to face. However, if a person understands their religion, if a person studies this issue correctly, they will not be confused. And that is why it is very important, my dear brothers and sisters, that we study this issue. But before we do that, let's also look fully at this ayah in Surah Al-Baqarah. And it's talking about the two angels, Harut and Marut. There are two angels that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he sent down. So these angels, they taught the people magic. Well, although the Mufassirun, they say no, they didn't actually teach the people magic. But what they did is they came down. If anyone wanted to learn about magic, they would direct them to a certain place. And when they went to that certain place, the shayateen would appear and those shayateen would teach the people magic. But Harut and Marut would not direct people to that place except that they warned them. This is a trial. This is a test. Beware, fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't fall into this act of disbelief. But so they said, but neither of these taught, meaning Harut and Marut, neither of them taught such magic until they have said, we are only a test, so do not disbelieve. Again, a clear proof that practicing magic or even learning magic with the intention of practicing it is an act of disbelief. But the people learnt from the two of them what would cause discord between a man and his wife but they could not harm anyone except by Allah's leave. And they learned what harmed them and not what benefited them. And they knew that anyone who deals in magic will have no share in the next life. Brothers and sisters, is it not a truth that in many Muslim lands, there are people who call themselves Muslim and who claim to be Muslim, who practice magic and seek others to practice magic and do acts of magic one upon the other. This is something that is very, very common. And we find this thing common in many, many Muslim countries. And this, my brothers and sisters, is a major act of disbelief. It is one of the most major sins. It is akin to shirk. In fact, it is an action of disbelief that is leading to shirk and is a type of shirk. So my brothers and sisters, this is very, very serious. And the reason is, is because it spreads mischief and confusion and hatred and discord amongst people. And it leads them to believe that human beings have powers that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has. 
And of course, the Prophet ﷺ said, and we mentioned this already, avoid the seven noxious things. And among those things the Prophet ﷺ mentioned was, of course, magic. So this is something, my dear brothers and sisters, that we should keep very, very, very far away from, practicing magic. Now, some people are very confused by this issue. They actually believe that the magicians have power. And they say, for example, well, I went to such and such magician or I went to such and such person and they did this and they did that and they told me this and they told me that. And they are confused about this matter because they think that what they see is the reality. This is the confusion of magic. But actually, the magician is only able to do these things because they have acquired the help of the evil shayateen amongst the jinn. And because they get the help of the jinn, they are able to do these things, and they pretend that they do these things because they have special powers. But in reality, they don't have those special powers. They are only able to do those things because what do they do? In order to get the jinn to cooperate with them, in order to get these evil spirits, these jinn to cooperate with them, they will do an act of disbelief. For example, they will urinate all the Qur'an or throw the Qur'an in a dirty place or they may even kill a child or they may do any matter of horrific things and they will eat impure things and so on. And all of these things is to show their readiness to disbelieve in Allah to transgress Allah's limits, and when they do that, the evil shayateen, the evil jinn, the evil spirits will cooperate with them, and they will be able to do things that normally a human being cannot do. For example, they will carry big things over a long distance, or they may be able to relate information to that person that normally you could not understand how could they get that information. And we'll talk about that in more detail when we discuss the other major, major sin, and that is the sin of fortune-telling and visiting fortune-tellers, which is also a type of shirk, and that's why we're going to put it next as well. So, when we'll discuss this issue next time, until then, brothers and sisters, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.